Hello, this is Chris O'Flaherty with Oculus. And on behalf of Oculus, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining another Oculus webinar. Um, today, our uh, presenter, Dr. Michael Bellin, is a professor of ophthalmology and vision science at the University of Arizona, Tucson. He's also vice president of international development for the Cornea Society and chair for the Associate, Association of University Professors of Ophthalmology Fellowship Compliance Committee. Over the years, Dr. Bellin has received several awards from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, including the Lifetime Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, during the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, enter those questions in the comments box on the right side of your screen. Uh, following the presentation, uh, we should have time to answer a few questions, and if we don't get a chance to answer them immediately, we will follow up with you uh, in the days following the webinar. Uh, without any further delay, I'd like to hand the floor over to Dr. Bellin. Thank you. Well, I'd like, like to thank all of you, uh, wherever you are, for list, listening in. What I was asked to talk about what we're going to be talking about are some really some basic information about imaging, specifically shine plug imaging, and uh, trying to give you some uh, things that separate some of the fact or fiction. I use kind of a moniker from the uh, myth, myth busters. Okay, so what I want to discuss is a common statement that elevation devices cannot produce accurate curvature, that in some way adding a placido disc to a shine flug is a benefit. I want to discuss a little bit about one shine flug versus multiple shine flug cameras, and then we'll talk a little bit about OCT, and then we'll get into uh, some imaging things about pellucid, specifically separating pellucid from keratoconus, and then also about uh, what is the best reference surface? So first, elevation. There's a, a common statement from people who are proponents of placebo. For some reason, placebo systems are inherently more accurate in producing curvature than elevation systems. And first, that's somewhat of a disinformation. First, shine flu clearly provides more data than placebo does. Placido systems only image, under the best circumstances, about 8 millimeters. And shine flugs, we, we off, often default to only showing 9 millimeters, but they easily can get out to 10 or 11 millimeters on the cornea. The picture on your left is a uh, placido, and that's a very standard picture with a lot of loss of data. And that's because Placido systems rely on a, a tear film. If there's any tear film irregularity, this was just really a moderately dry eye, that data is lost. And you can see you rarely see that. Matter of fact, I've never seen that type of pattern on a shine flug device because shine flugs don't, it's not a reflective system, it's an optical cross section. So surface reg regularity has no real effect on a shine flug. But it's been claimed that placido systems are somehow more accurate at measuring curvature. And the assertion that elevation system is not as sensitive as placebo systems is incorrect. And I use Archimedes' lever as an example of basically a statement that sounds logical but clinically is not correct. And Archimedes said, he's a famous mathematician, said, give me a place to stand and I can move the earth. Now, in theory, if you have a long enough lever, you can generate a huge amount of force, but obviously, clinically, that's an impossibility. So the, the concept about placido being somehow inherently more accurate or sensitive for curvature, I'll push it a little bit and say it's scientifically correct but clinically flawed. And what you will see people will show you, and actually, this is a, a, a sketch I gave to some of my placido friends we don't call them placebo friends, but to make their point, and that is these are three objects. The three objects have identical curvature. They're just different cord, cord lengths, but they're exactly the same curvature. And as you can see, as the cord length gets smaller, 
the elevation difference becomes smaller and smaller. So the argument is, and hopefully my cursor shows up for your talk, that this curvature and this curvature and this curvature are identical. But you'll notice that the elevations get significantly smaller and smaller. So the argument is that because the curvature is identical among all these three, that the placido systems are equally adept at measuring these three. But as you get a smaller chord length, the elevation gets very, very small. And at some point, that elevation becomes below a measurable amount, even though the curvature hasn't changed. Well, sounds logical. The problem is this. In order to measure the exact same curvature, but at smaller chord lengths, you have to get rings that are closer and closer together. In other words, a placido system doesn't find it as easy to read this as it does to read this. As you get smaller chord lengths, in order to have reading, you have to get rings closer and closer together. Now, there's two things that make it a limiting factor. First, there's a reason why there is no, at least to my knowledge at the moment, there's no placido system that has more than 32 rings. And that's because as rings get closer and closer, effectively they, they merge with any type of surface irregular. A normal, even a normal pristine corneal surface has irregularities in the tear film. And when you get below 32 rings, it basically becomes a non-analyzable -an reflection. So here's one that actually you can see some ab abnormalities in the rings merge. You can see here the rings merge. And that's, again, why there's no system that really has more than 32 rings. So that argument that a placido system has an equal job of reading all these three because the coverage is the same, well, the coverage is the same, is true. But as the area gets smaller and smaller to have any accuracy, you have to put more and more rings in a smaller area. And they're just not capable of, of doing that. And again, as I say here, there's a reason why the greatest number of rings used clinically is 32. And that, again, as you get, if you attempt to get more rings, then you just get really more loss, loss of data as those rings merge. Uh, because of just an absolutely normal surface irregularity in a tear film. A normal, not a dry eye, a normal eye will not allow you to get more rings than, than, than clinically 32. And this is actually a paper we published a long time ago, in 1995, and it wasn't with the Penicam, and it wasn't with the Scheinflug device. It was with a prototype device that helped develop. It was another elevation device. And the other thing that you hear people is they quote accuracy or the ability to measure curvature on spherical test objects. And if you really go back, way back in the early literature, what they used was ball, ball bearings, highly reflective, absolutely smooth surface. Again, clinically meaningless. First of all, the eye is not a highly reflective ball bearing, and also the eye is not spherical. Why does that matter? Well, if your entire surface is spherical, no matter how noisy your readings are, you can average out your noise because the curvature is the same everywhere. And if you average the noise out, you'll still get that same, quote, single curvature reading. And there was a, the first machine that really was mm -hmm. very popular. One of, the, one of the early machines was ISIS. And it would average tremendously. And it tested out very well on spherical ball bearings, but it did a very poor job when it got to the cornea. So what we did is we actually did some measurements on, again, these were test objects, but test objects that were not spherical. So we looked at an A sphere, and we looked at a, a shape that mimicked a myopic ablation, in other words, a shape with two, two different curvatures. And this is the amount of error that we found in this was the Alcon IMAP at the time. This was the Humphrey Atlas. And this was that uh, was a PAR CTS, which was an ele elevation system. And what you will see is that the error on the placido systems on every testing mechanism we did was significantly higher. Here you'll notice when we have two different curvatures, or rates of what we call a curvature discontinuity, the error was extremely high in the placido systems and not much different here versus an A3. And that's because the elevation systems use triangulation. They're not dependent on what, on what was next to it, basically. So when you have 
curvature continuity dis or discontinuities here, we had a huge amount of error on the Placido systems. Again, this was published back in uh, Optometric Visual Science back in 95. And if you think about that, triangulation is an extremely accurate method of localizing space. And if you just think about, I mean, all of us, almost all of us now have GPS in our car. And if you do the math, uh, GPS, standard GPS, not military, just the stuff we have in our car, has a, a localization accuracy of about 10 feet. And if you go out to where those satellites are, that's roughly equivalent to about 0 0.00001 microns on the corneal surface if you, if you use that same type of ratio. So triangulation is actually a very highly accurate method of lo lo localization. And then let's put a little bit more in clinical. And I'll try to flip through some of these pictures quickly. But early on, there was also a, uh, not really a paper, but a presentation um, where they tried to compare a number of Placido systems to a Scheinflug device or an elevation system. And the problem with that was what, what they ended up using was a software package that was designed strictly for Placido systems to kind of translate different companies' Placidos back, back and forth. It was never designed for elevation data. And what they got was basically er erroneous information. So we actually did a comparative study, and this was just using the Humphrey Atlas, which at the time was one of the more respected Placido systems. And what we did, rather than using any conversion software, we basically just took the Humphrey color scale and scale and duplicated on the pentacam. And this is the Humphrey scale on the left. And what, what basically did is we, we made a duplicate color scale, same colors, same ranges for the pentacam. And now I'll just flip through a bunch of these pictures. And what we did is both visually did an inspection, but we also did actually a numerical com com comparison. And we don't have time to look at all the diff different numbers, but really what we really do is I want you to look clinically at the pictures that you'll see on the placido and the pictures that you'll see on the pentacam here. And two things that you will notice. One is that the pentacam routinely will give you much greater coverage than you'll see on a placido system. And realize we're actually truncating the data off on the pentacam at nine millimeters. We could have opened it up even wider. But you will see, and again, it's hard to see on these numbers, but nine millimeters actually would fall out about here on this system. And the other thing that you'll notice is that the maps convey the same information. So let's look at this. Here's, here's the next patient. Again, you'll see the dropout of data here. But again, the information that's being conveyed clinically is the same. You'll see it here again. Again, notice the big dropout that you'll see on the placebo system. And here you can see a huge amount of dropout of data here and no loss of data. For those of you who are familiar with the Pentacamp, this is not extrapolated data. Extrapolated data on a test camera is either shown as white, in other words, you'll, you won't see any, or as black dots. So you'll notice here, this is all com complete data. But again, you'll notice that clinically, the information that you're, you're getting, here you'll see what looks like a slightly asymmetric bow tie. I hate those terms, but you'll see the exact same thing here. Again, notice the loss of data, no loss of data here. And this is done by the same experienced technician literally within minutes of each other, and we alternated which one was done first. Again, you'll see it here. Again, so you can see here, I, we purposely did this to show you that we are not extrapolating data, but compare that loss of data to that loss of data. And this mark here is only eight millimeters, and that's nine over here. So a huge difference in the amount of data that you're actually getting. The reason I'm going over this is because I get sent a lot of maps routinely to assist people with, and it's not uncommon that they'll send Pentacam and they'll also send Placido images for curvature. Or you'll hear people say, well, I still like looking at my curvature. You can still look at curvature, but the curvature you have here is no different than here other than giving you better information and better data and better coverage. Again, same thing, same information you would get, just much better coverage. And I'll just flip, flip through the rest quickly.
and here you can really see an extreme loss of, of, of data, complete loss, loss of data in a patient with relatively dry eyes. And again, no loss of data in a panic. And so again, I have no problem with people want to continue to use, but there's really no clinical reason to basically immune someone on multiple systems. I think we've held maybe out of only one or two more patients. Again, you can see again that we're not filling in vacant here. Here we don't have coverage. But again, compare the loss of data here to what you see here as a loss of data. And again, notice a significant loss here and a complete exam here. We Again, other than a significant difference in corneal coverage, and again, the Penicam has much greater coverage than any placebo system, the curvature maps clinically will convey the same information. And we did, we did a similar comparison using the Penicam and the, and the Magellan. Here the maps are up and down, not left and right. But again, you will see that the clinical information you would get between the two systems, it's identical. And again, you can see the Magellan, um, again, a loss of, of data here. We did that because one is a, a, is a close range placebo and one is a, long dist a, a longer range placebo. So again, clinically, the information looks the same. Now, I keep saying clinically looks the same. And the reason for that is while clinically identical, and for all clinical uses, they are identical, they will never be absolutely identical, and that's because the placebo measures the tear film and the shine fluke measures the actual corneal surface. But clinical interpretation of your data, there will be no, no difference. The fact that placebo systems measure off the tear film and not actually off the corneal surface was actually used as an advantage by Oculus in their carotograph where they actually use that to assist in the diagnosis and in a uh, numerical evaluation of dry eye patients. But when you're looking to evaluate the corneal surface for shape, you don't want loss of data. So you don't want a dry eye patient who comes in for refractive surgery and you get an incomplete image. So again, the shine flugs are basically not affected. They're affected by a patient who can't open their eyes, but really are not affected by the corneal surface or by the quality of the tear film. So let's go to the next quote, what I call disinformation. That is, adding a placebo disc to a shine food is a benefit. Well, we already showed you that elevation can generate curvature maps, and they'll generate curvature maps of better quality and better coverage than a placebo. And the reason for that is strictly mathematical. If your elevation data is accurate, then you'll generate accurate curvature data because curvature is the second derivative of elevation. So it's just, again, if your elevation is accurate, your curvature will be ac accurate. If your elevation is accurate, your curvature will not be accurate. The analogy that I, and I, I used GPS before, I'll go back to G GPS. GPS is highly accurate. It knows exactly where you are at any point in time. Your GPS device also can measure speed. Speed is like curvature. Your speedometer is like your placebo system. Your, plus, your speedometer can't tell you what your elevation or where you are, but your GPS device, as long as your GPS is accurate, measures your speed actually probably more accurately than your speedometer does. So again, if your elevation is accurate, your curvature data will be accurate and your curvature maps from a, a shine flu device will look the same as from a placebo other than the area of coverage will be much greater. So how about the claim that two cameras are somewhat inherently better than one? First, I think it's very important to make a distinction that the systems that are, quote, dual shine flug, if you read the company's actual literature, they'll never use the word two cameras because they're not two cameras. It's one, still one shine flu camera. They have two optical paths. Um, and that 
they also incorporate and there's a, a number of now, there's probably four or five, if not more, Shine Flu devices. And a number of them do utilize a placebo disc and claims that placebo, again, somehow improves their ac accuracy. So as I said, first you should read the fine print. You'll, you actually will see that the company, there's some articles that are incorrect, but you'll see the company will actually never come out and say two Shine Flu cameras because they're not, they use they use terms dual channels or dual imaging, but not really two, two, two cameras. So let's first go back to this statement. I said before, if your elevation is accurate, you do not need a placido disc. And this you'll see here, this is a, a system that combines a placido system, and these are the, quote, dual shine field. I won't use the word cameras because they're not, but dual shine fluke paths. So as I said already, a curvature is the second derivative of elevation. So if you can generate accurate curvature, accurate elevation, excuse me, your curvature will be accurate. If your elevation is accurate, you do not need a placido disc. You will hear that they need it for accuracy. It is actually somewhat of a um, company because they can't actually duplicate the exact same registration system that the Pentacam has. So it's a way of getting around some um, patent concerns. But more so, if you actually look at this, okay, you'll notice that the coverage from the Placido is actually less than 50% of the cornea. This is a shine plug image. The shine plug image goes limbus to limbus. Right? You don't always get patients who will open their eyes to expose limbus to limbus, but the shine flug image goes limbus to limbus. Your placido image covers less, and under optimal conditions, optimal conditions covers less than 50% of the cornea. So right off the bat, if they rely on a placido augmentation to generate elevation data, what happens to the other 50% of the cornea that has no placido? But more so, and I, I think I'm probably in the, I'm jumping maybe ahead of a couple slides, generating elevation data from the anterior surface is orders of magnitude easier than generating elevation data off the posterior cornea. If you need to rely on a placido augmentation to generate anterior data, then what happens on the posterior cornea? because you can't get a placido image on the posterior cornea because it's a ref placidos are reflective. So again, it's easier, it's easy to generate anterior elevation than posterior elevation, and if you can't generate anterior elevation without a placido, then what in the world are you doing on the posterior surface? So to me, a placido system tacked onto a shine flug is more of a red flag than, than a benefit. So again, if either of those was correct and they required placido assistance to generate that curvature, then again, as I said, what do they rely on for the posterior surface? So again, this is going to be, this is actually not a shine flu, but I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison here of the orb scan versus the Pentacam. Now many of you, orb scan, while I don't think they're selling many units, it's still a widely used unit and was really the, uh, the prototype of the device that did both anterior, posterior, and full corneal thickness maps. The problem with, again, the orb scan is it was fairly inaccurate. And I, I want you to notice this. This is their anterior elevation data. This is their anterior curvature. Right off the bat, you should ask yourself, well, if they, if they keep telling me that I need placido to increase their accuracy, why is this map so poor in coverage versus their elevation map? Because they're generating data way out here that there's clearly no placido help for that. So again, notice the cur curvature coverage, and this again is the side-by-side, -side. notice the curvature coverage on the shine flug. It's complete, very little bit here. So again, relying on a placido for curvature is strictly because their elevation data was very suspect. Now, the reason for that with the orb scan is, is a number of reasons. Uh, one is they did have difficulty in the, some of the later models with their edge detection. But the other thing, if you think about it, the orb scan did 
basically slices all, not just the pentacam, but all shine flutes to kind of uh, circular slices. Circular slices like a pie all share a common point. The orb scan did basically vertical parallel cuts. No cut had a common point. So that's kind of like trying to put a puzzle together and the person tells you, when we put a puzzle together, the first thing we usually do is we look to the corner pieces, they're easy to identify, and then we look to pe that are pieces next to it. The orb scan is like trying to put a puzzle together and the person telling you, but I don't want you to have any two pieces next to each other first. Just randomly put pieces down. They don't share common points. It's very difficult to reconstruct. And that was a number of limitations on the, on, on the orb scan. Again, very similarly here, you'll see very loss of data here and complete coverage here. So to me, again, if I see, I have, the systems may be fine, but there's really absolutely no reason to rely on a placido if your shine fluke is, is producing accurate ele elevation data. I view it more as a crutch, not really as an aspect. So how about two, two systems? And again, I'm going to avoid saying two cameras, but at least two optical paths. We're told that two optical paths is somewhat inherently advantageous and that it adds into the accuracy of the system. And I just, again, use kind of an analogy of our razor blade, um, you know, claims that two are better. This is, you know, a razor with 22 blades. So the problem with their claim, again, this whole talk today is supposed to be separating fact from fiction, is that if you actually look at the Pentacam, the Pentacam has a single path and a single camera. And while we say it rotates, which it does 360 degrees, it doesn't image 360. It only images for half the circle. Okay? And the reason for that is that you can't image most of the time because of the brow and the nose. So the image it's taking, while it does optical sections across, it's coming basically from the temporal portion of the eye, because that's anatomically where you can get your optical cross section. This is the camera. When the camera passes, notice, actually, if you just look at the placido disc here, you see how you've lost the placido disc here? Because this is a nose shadow. So when that camera rotates into this area, it's, in, it's, not, it's not imaging anything. So the concept of two cameras is somewhat of a, you can have a dozen cameras, but if they can't image every time they cross over here, you'll notice that they're actually in what's called the blind spot about 40% of the cornea. So you're really only getting data out in this area here. So again, the second optical path that's not a camera is blocked by the nose and the brow about 40% of the time. So there really is no inherent advantages. Actually, this is something known by Oculus a long time ago, which is why they actually don't even attempt. They, they do their optical cross-sections from basically 180 degrees. So as I say here, I'm going to back up one that, you know, uh, you may need more than one if you're not good enough with, with one, but there's really no inherent advantage to um, any, any, anything more. And again, if I go, you go back to the idea of GPS, realizing that G, GPS is actually very often only one, one satellite. There's multiple satellites. You actually only need one satellite for a GPS uh, localization. Now, there's been a number of, uh, there's, there's lots of articles on multiple different machines. And I'm not quoting any article I did, but I actually purposely went for ones that I thought were um, completely unbiased investigators. And this was one that was published back in 2012 that I thought was very interesting. It's dual versus single shine flu camera for anterior segment analysis, precision and agreement. And that's Journal of Character and Fractive Surgery. And what that paper was, again, to assess the repeat, repeat, uh, repeatability, reproducibility, and agreement of the Pentacam HR single camera in Galilei. And they used dual cam, which again is actually incorrect, but shine flu device and anterior segment analysis. And I'll tell you right off the bat, there's not one that is big superior than the other, but their conclusions and what they found is very interesting in, because of this. 
So their conclusions, the repeatability and reproducibility were good for all parameters. The single camera device was more precise for curvature, astigmatism, corneal wavefront error, and the dual device for pachymetry measurements. I will tell you clinically there was no big difference, but what's interesting about this is that the Pentacam was superior exactly where you would think the other machine should be in things that, quote, well, you need a placido for curvature and you need a placido for anterior measurements. All the anterior measurements, quote, curvature and astigmatism, were better on the single camera device with no placido. So again, this was an independent paper. Uh, actually, it was from a company that currently makes one, but neither the, the Galileo or, or the Pentacam but shows you that there really is absolutely no advantage to sticking a placido onto a shine flug as long as your shine flug is accurate. So, and again, I, I repeat his conclusion here, but in other words, the system without the placido outperformed the dual, and I put a camera here, placido in exactly the places they claim where the placido should be a benefit, the anterior curvature and anterior surface. So again, hopefully I convinced you, at least made you think a little bit about, that it really is of no benefit, it's of no asset, and that you really do not need a placido system if you, again, have an accurate elevation that will generate curvature. I want to briefly just compare, very briefly, OCT to shine fluid devices. And again, I think partly because of familiarity with OCT in the retina, uh, there is a feeling that somehow that OCT is somewhat more inherently accurate. And that stems from one major frame. There's a number of different OCT devices. And actually, they're, they're improving greatly in time as their acquisition time is getting shorter and shorter. There's a time domain, which is the Visanti spectral domain. It's, it's what, a number more than I'm saying here, Sirius, the RT view, view, and SWEP source at uh, Castia. Uh, there are a number of different OCT devices. And I'm going to skip by this because I just really want to make one point. And what you will hear is that the major advantage of OCT is that they have faster scan acquisition times. And I'll use actually a slow OCT, which is the um, Versante. Versante images in an eighth of a second, and the Pentacam does it in two seconds. So right off the bat, people have the concept that, well, it takes two seconds to complete an acquisition for a Pentacam. There's obviously some patient movement, and the OCT a lot of new ones are even faster than that, but it's an eighth of a second. So clearly, OCT has some inherent advantages. And I'll tell you right off the bat, OCT does have some advantages for certain things, but measuring is not one of them. And this is why. It is not acquisition time, sorry, scan time that's important. It's acquisition time. And again, I'm big on, on analogies. It's true that the Pentacam, and most shine flu devices take about two seconds of scan time. But during that scan, they are not acquiring data. So what I did here to give you an analogy is actually this is where I work. This is a, the Tucson VA. It's kind of a very unusual VA, and that's actually beautiful. But this is a camera that I scanned across for two seconds, and I took an image. I took five images. That's kind of what the Pentacam does. It scans, and that scan does take two seconds, but the image is like taking a photograph. It's an optical cross-section photograph, the shine plug image. Notice how clear these images are. Okay? This is the same scanning. I set, I set the shutter at an eighth of a second. That's what this is. Yes, the scan time is much quicker here. This was a two-second scan. This was an eight-second scan. But the, look at the quality of these images versus this. This is what OCT does. Its scan time and its acquisition time are the same. Shine flug, the scan time is different than its acquisition time. So what you will see here is what's critical on shine flug devices is their image registration because their optical cross sections 
are basically like taking a, a you know a, a camera at a thousandth of a second. So the clarity of the images is excellent. So what you'll see here, that's really the difference between OCT. At the moment, ShineTool devices are actually still be better measurement devices. Eventually in the future, as again, scan times and acquisition times and OCT is getting better and better, but they're still not up to the point of ShineTool devices. The other major advantage of ShineTool over OCT is again, ShineTool gives you limbal to limbal coverage. Uh, and some of the more uh, OCT devices that are being used, particularly for refractive surgery, one of the more popular ones only covers six, six the central six millimeters, which actually is only 25% of the corneal surface. Cornea is roughly 12, so the area is squared, so it's 12 squared versus six squared. So that's only 25% of the corneal surface. So OCT is, however, a better imaging modality than Scheinflug. Scheinflug, however, is a better measuring modality. When I say imaging modality, looking at the angle, et cetera. And actually, OCT is more susceptible to motion artifact because, again, the acquisition scan time are one and the same. Uh, I think we'll just skip by this to get to the other one. So now I'm going to actually get away from discussing the different mechanics of the system and talk a little bit about more about some of clinical application. And I have a, an interest in keratoconus and I have an interest in pellucid and most ectatic disease. It's been probably a, a pet peeve of mine that we, we've changed the diagnosis of pellucid marginal degeneration. When I was a fellow, which unfortunately was a long, long time ago, Pellucid was a very rare ent ent entity. And the classic definition of pellucid is a non-inflammatory band of thinning, one to two millimeters from the inferior limbus, a flat topography above, a rapid change in curvature at the band of thinning. But again, I want to stress that one to two millimeter band, almost like a linear band, but from one to two millimeters from the inferior limbus. The problem is that we ended up changing the definition of pellucid to match our technology. We didn't try to get the technology to better diagnose pellucid. And this is what you see very often people call pellucid marginal degeneration or this type of crab claw pattern. And you, you won't go to a refractive meeting and you won't see a, a, an article written where you won't see this and the name attached to this is pellucid marginal degeneration. So first realize, and I've already said this, that pellucido systems are limited to covering only about 60% of the cornea. And this is actually a pellucido system. This is, um, and you can see that the rings were reflected out to here, but this was not analyzed because the, the rings were not clear enough. But this is the amount that you'll analyze. The problem with pellucid, it's not really a problem, true pellucid, Pathology is outside the area analyzed by a placido system. This is where the pathology is in true pellucid. Now, you do get changes in shape above this. You get a flattening above and a rapid change in the area of thinning. But the bulk of the pathology, the thing that's pathognomonic for pellucid, the inferior band of thinning, is outside the range or the area that's analyzed on a placido system. Curvature patterns such as you'll hear crab claw, are actually measurement most of the time, not always, because you will see true pellucid will give you that pattern. But most of the time, they're anomalies and do not represent peripheral shape. Almost all topographic PMD is actually inferior keratoconus. And there's a reason why that becomes clinically important. And this is a nice animation by uh, a PhD from Italy, Renzo Mattoli, and this will show you, this is actually, the picture on the left is sagittal curvature, the one on the right is tangential curvature, and what you will see is that as you analyze closer to the center, you get this crab claw pattern, but as you then analyze actually where the cone is located, you'll notice that it becomes conical looking. So this is now where the cone is, but this is that actually how we measure it, and you get that quote core pattern, which is, again, an anomaly of curvature. 
all these, this is the same shape. We're just changing the reference axis for measurement. So PMD, again, this type of pattern, more often than not equals placido marginal G generation, not pellucid. So why is that? So again, this is now I'm going to show it to you. And that's true whether the curvature is measured on a shine flug, an OCT, or a placido. It's an anomaly of the curvature measurements. And I already told you that the curvature maps produced on a shine flug are clinically identical to those on a placido, but that's a limitation of curvature. So here you will see what looks like a very classic pellucid, crab claw, flattening, this pattern that, you, that everyone has been calling pellucid. But this is now the full picture of that. This is the anterior elevation. That's the cone. This is the back elevation. That's the cone. But this is the critical one to look at. This is the corneal thickness map. This is the thin point. This is keratoconus. This is inferior keratoconus. And notice that when the cone is inferior, just like I showed you, see if I can back up. Like I showed you here, when the cone's inferior, like it is here, see that? When you analyze it, we do, in other words, through the apex, you get that pseudo pattern. Let's get back to that. So this is not pellucid. This is inferior keratoconus. And the corneal thickness map is probably the single most critical map to look at to separate true pellucid from keratoconus. Again, here is another example. Notice the curvature map. People would call this pellucid. This is that same patient on a placido system. But notice again, this is where the cone is located. This is the back surface cone. And notice again the corneal thickness map. There's no inferior band of thinning. It's inferior keratoconus. Again, this is a right and left, right and left. You'll notice here this pattern. You'll see the same thing on a shine flu because, again, it's, not, it's the curvature. But this is now a picture of true pellucid. So here's a, a split lamp of true pellucid. A, a nice way to show true pellucid is actually to look at the shine flu images. So this is a horizontal cut. You can see the cut over here. It's a horizontal cut. And notice it looks very normal. And now this, you'll see we took a vertical cut. And notice the inferior band of thinning. So a flat here, inferior band of thinning, and a sharp change in curvature right at that band of thinning. But the other good way to look at true pellucid is with the picometry map. Again, I want you to realize, again, this is a curvature map on a placido. It's just no data here. But this is the picometry map. And if you notice, you no longer see that 9 millimeter limitation. So if in order to look at pellucid, you really have to open the map up all the way. And yes, this data is somewhat extrapolated because it's way out in the periphery, but that's what you're looking for, that inferior band of thinning. This is how you determine true pellucid pack map. This is not inferior keratoconus. It's just that inferior band of thinning. Again, compare that. Notice. Here's, on the, on the corneal thickness map, here's the area of thinning. On the anterior elevation, that's the cone. On the postulating, that's the cone. But look what happens on the curvature map. It looks like it's over here. It's an anomaly of curvature. So why is this important? I'll tell you why it's important. I'm going to back up the slide because I don't know if I show it afterwards. You will hear routinely people will talk about putting rings in for pellucid. And what they'll tell you as well, I even do it asymmetric rings, or I put just inferior rings. Well, that is fine as long as your pellucid is actually just inferior keratoconus. But it would be extremely problematic and actually dangerous to try to put an inferior ring through true pellucid. This cornea thins down to about 120 microns. So it is really important to, to separate true pellucid from what really is just inferior keratoconus, because what you're told to do for pellucid is really what should be done for just inferior keratoconus. And if you end up with this unusual but a true case of pellucid, most of those recommendations are actually not safe. So again, here's another patient you can see here. And you, you notice what it thins down to, very thin reading. So again, this is true pellucid. You can see that band of thinning here. And you can imagine 
that if all you were looking at is a central six or seven millimeters of the cornea, and we're only looking at a curvature map, and you tried to put a ring through this, you, you, you're going to be in trouble. So again, the problem is, is this is not what you see if all you're looking at is, is a placido drive curvature map. This is what you see, and you missed the pathology. So again, to, you have to rely on technology. You can't rely on technology that images I say nine, but most of the time it's only about seven or eight millimeters. That's not where the pathology is. And while most of the time it's only a semantic, whether it's PMD or keratoconus, if you end up with a rare occasion where you truly have pellucid, you need to know that because the treatments are very, very different for true pellucid. And crab claw patterns are aberrations. They're not really indicative of pellucid. And again, those crab claw patterns will be present whether the curvature is from a placido, from a shine fluke, or from OCT. So I would, um, again, this is uh, about four years old already, but we uh, did a paper, what's in a name, keratoconus, pellucid, marginal degeneration, related thinning disorders, where we actually go over uh, the distinction between these. And we actually went back to a number of published articles that were um, pellucid. We actually had them send their uh, raw data, if they used a, a Penicam, we reanalyzed it and they actually all agreed that these were not true cases of pellucid. So finally, I'm just going to briefly talk about different reference surfaces. Uh, right off the bat, there is no better reference surface. A reference surface is a, sounds stupid, is a reference surface. A reference surface doesn't improve accuracy. The only reason for a reference surface is to make something easier to un understand. In other words, if I want to measure the height of a building, I can measure it from the sidewalk. It'll give me one number. I can measure it from sea level. It'll probably give me a different number. I can measure it from the depth of the excavation or the basement. That'll give me a different number. They're both accurate. They're all different, as long as I know where I'm measuring it. But there's not one that's inherently more accurate. So you know, is there a better reference surface? The answer is, there is as far as this intuitive understanding of what you're looking at, and that's what I'm a proponent for, and I'm a proponent of just looking at a best fit sphere because it's easier. So let's look at a sphere versus a toric ellipsoid. And to me, this is an example. I'll show you this, and to me, this is enough of a reason to use a sphere. So let's look at these two, and they're not corneas, but we'll just call them test objects. The one on your left, is spherical with a, a K of 44. The one on the right is an eight diopter astigmat with Ks of 40 by 48. So clearly the, uh, the spherical equivalent of the shape on the right is the same as on the left. The average is 44. So what would I see if I image these and use a best fit sphere reference? Well, we would see what we expect to see. If we use a spherical reference surface and the shape on the left is a perfect sphere, it would be zero. There would be no difference, one, one, one color. Okay? And if we had an eight diopter astigmat on the right and we compare it to a sphere, what we would see is that in the steep meridian, so what we see here, we are below the sphere, and in the flat meridian, as you see here, you're above the sphere. Now, if I didn't tell you one of these was spherical and one of these was a high astigmat, but I told you I'm using a best fit sphere, which one is which, none of you would have difficulty. This is spherical. This is an astigmatic. It would be easy for you to tell. Now let's do the exact same thing now with a toric ellipsoid. Same thing. Here we have a spherical shape on the left, an astigmatic shape on the right. And what do they look like if we use a toric ellipsoid? They look like this. So a toric ellipsoid, a best fit toric ellipsoid, fits a sphere. It's a toric ellipsoid of zero eccentricity. It also fits a perfect astigmat perfectly. The problem is I want to know if I have eight diopters of astigmatism. A toric ellipsoid is a great shape to use to look at optical properties. 
And actually, there are some companies that have something they call it an irregularity map. It, it basically tells you what you can correct with glasses. And a spherical, a perfect sphere and a perfect astigmat can be corrected with spheral cylindrical optics. These two, optically, if corrected, can perform very well. But as a refractive surgeon or as a cataract surgeon, I want to know if there's eight diapers of cylinder. This is why I don't use, why I use a best fit sphere. I want maps that look like this when there's eight diopters versus a sphere, not like this. So the other thing is an argument that, particularly for refractive surgery, if you're looking for a cone, you don't want to use a cone as a reference surface. Okay? If I'm looking for, you know, I mean, it's got his name already, but what the guy's name is for this. But you don't want to put it in a sea of similar things. So there's whatever the guy's name is. I forgot already what his name is. But again, if I want to look for a cone, I want something that accentuates the cone, not best fits the cone. So let's give you an example of that. And because we're running out of time, I'm just going to skip to the samples here. So this is just, this is a patient with keratoconus. This is a sphere. This is a toric ellipsoid. Again, as long as I know what I'm using and I know my normal values, they both could be equally accurate. But as far as doing a quick visual inspection, this is much easier to identify than that. Notice the elevation difference. Again, I want a greater separation. I don't want something that fits the cone. I want something that ex exaggerates the cone. And for those of you who are familiar with the bad display, that's what the enhanced reference surface does. It actually further exaggerates it. But notice that this is much easier to pick up than it is over here. So here, this is a case of advanced keratoconus. Okay, big cone here, big cone here. And now let's look at that again. If you, if you look at the, uh, I just want to show you, this is this is advanced keratoconus. And now let's look at it with the sphere versus the toric ellipse. Easy to pick up the cone here on the sphere. Easy to pick it up here. Somewhat masked over here. And notice how much more difficult it is, this versus this. Why? Because it's a cone. And we're fitting a cone to a cone. That's not what you want to do. You want something to show the cone, to make the cone stand out. So again, a sphere is just much easier to do visual inspection. Again, very similar side by side. And then I'm going to skip over these for time. This again, just to show you, this is a markedly advanced keratoconus case. Notice the, the corneal thickness is down to 244. Markedly advanced keratoconus. Using a sphere, using a toric ellipsoid. I think everyone that this is much easier to pick, pick up. And I'm going to actually skip by these just for reasons of time. But actually, this now is we're comparing a sphere, an ellipsoid, a toric ellipsoid that's fixed, and a best fit toric ellipsoid. This is the sphere. This is the ellipse. I think these are pretty much equally the same. You can pick this up, but notice that it's much less prominent. And in the best fit sphere, it's even less prominent. Here's another example. Notice you only, and these are cases of obvious keratoconus. It, picks, it shows up very well on the sphere, but really gets masked, gets completely masked here. Again, another example. There's the cone, the ellipsoid. You can pick it up, but not nearly as obvious. You can pick it up here, not as obvious not as obvious. This, again, is clinically easier to make visual inspections. And that's really what this all is about. It's looking at a map and quickly determining whether the patient is normal or, or not. Same thing here. So the point I want to make today is just to kind of go over a number of different what I call misconceptions that you really don't need to go back and rely on a placebo system if your elevation is accurate. Um, be aware that, again, if you generate accurate ele elevation, you don't need multiple optical paths. You don't need placidos. And that if you really want to diagnose pellucid, the best things to look at are the shine fluid images and opening up your corneal thickness map basically to limbus to limbus. And while the reference surface used for elevation doesn't affect accuracy, it does affect your ability to make quick, easy visual inspection and for that, a sphere conveys the, the most easy, understandable information. And 
I'm going to skip by this because we're already 557. So I'll just get past this for a second. So I'm going to close with, with a little funny thing. So people who argue against full tomographic information have buried their hands in the heads in the sand or perhaps somewhere else. And just to remind all of you, if you're attending AFCRS, that will be a, a meeting of the experts. The Oculus booth is 1845, and I believe I'm there on Saturday from 11 to 12. So it's uh, just about 6 o'clock when we're supposed to end. I want to thank you 